The following is presented to you in a round sound. It was recorded with whatever was lying around. Lady, don't take no shit. Insist on respect the sister. Walk around like a woman. Yeah. She won't speak less of something worse. Singing, don't play. The girl take herself so serious. Man. People stare curious. Man. She got a natural way. Her hips sway furious. Yeah, the luxurious. Man. Hey, this is Lady Don't Take No, your weekly roundup of all of the real and none of the fake. I'm your host, Alicia Garza. This show is pro-black, pro-queer, proudly feminist, and pro-do-what-you-like. Every week, you're going to get the best of what goes on in my head, what we loving on, and what we hating on, what we might be, and what we ain't going to do. Politics pop culture. Oh, um, I don't know how Kevin McCarthy fucked around and found out. We cover it all. We know that no matter where you are, it's a challenging time, a changing time, a time of transformation. It's all the things all the time nowadays, but we are going to help you understand the dynamics of this time all the time. So please tune in, tell a friend and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. We do it for the culture, so the pod is free 99, because we know that with a country in chaos, the least we could do is keep you from putting your money anywhere else than where it's needed. Boundless imagination, she bounced this idea off me, Jack, that had me out in space, somewhere just float, not knowing the way back. Our guest this week is the co-founder and CEO of Hit Strategies, the leading millennial and minority-owned public opinion research firm in Washington, D.C. He is widely recognized as one of America's foremost pollsters and political strategists. He has been recognized by Politico's Recast 2023 Power List and selected for the American Association of Political Consultants 2023 Class of 40 Under 40. Ooh, yes. His insights on American politics have been featured in the Washington Post, Politico, and on NPR, MSNBC, and countless other outlets. Please, please, please welcome my favorite data scientist in the land, Terrence Woodbury. Terrence, hey. What's up, Alicia? Thanks for having me. Oh, it is so good to have you. I have been waiting, 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 like with bated breath for this conversation. So let's dive in because I have a lot of things to ask you. Let's do this. Okay. So look, I usually start off asking about pandemic politics, but I'm going to like breeze right past that. We are still in a pandemic, people. So there's that. And I don't care what anybody says. People are out here still getting COVID. I had COVID COVID. last week. Okay. See, See, it's a real thing. It really is. I had it last week. Like really, really. Okay. So people, it's still out here. We're going to dive into talking about what is on my mind almost every single day these days, which is 2024. So Terrence, I want to start off with this question because I think it's a nice lead in to what I want to talk to you about today. So here's the deal. We are living in a very politically polarized time. And I know for Black folks, right, when we talk about politics being polarizing, we're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> politics has always been polar, okay? There's been white people's politics and then black people's politics. We like get this already. So all these people who are like waxing poetic about polarization, I'm like, what is you talking about right now? Right. Okay, we already know that. Politics is polarized. And like, look, let's just break it down for people who are listening. On the one hand, we have a party that has literally been taken over by conspiracy theorists, election deniers who still believe that their king, Donald Trump, is the rightful and real president of the United States. And then also in that mix is like unabashed racist, sexist, and homophobes. Mm -hmm. And no, I'm not using this in the same way that Hillary Clinton used deplorables. I am speaking like real ass facts here. This is not elitist. This is like you got Tommy Tuberville talking about white supremacists are Americans, basically saying it's all good. Okay. You got sexists and homophobes. That is not opinion, people. That is actually fact. That's right. That's one party. Now, on the other hand, we have a party that seems to be stuck in the 1970s. Okay. It's like it has a moderately liberal agenda, but it's very slow to embrace what is really needed to activate the base and the potential base that would most 
likely align with its politics and its values and for whom addressing their issues would probably actually most likely keep us from fucking falling off a cliff. Okay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay. I mean, that sounds pretty accurate to me. Yeah. Right. So you have these two parties that are basically in crisis and it's a mess. So there's a lot of talk right now still, which I can't believe because what does bipartisanship look like right now, people? (laughs) I'm like, bipartisan between who? (laughs) I don't get it, but I'm just going, I'm a flow with y'all because, you know, this yo country, okay? I'm a flow with y'all. And I'm going to say, y'all keep talking about bipartisanship and reaching across the aisle. Like, that's still a real fucking thing. But for that to happen, let's just say that we could bipartisan our way to peace in this day and age. To have that happen, like, wouldn't people have to figure out how to change their mind? So, Terrence, with that lead up, I want to ask you, can you tell me a story about a time that you changed your mind about something that you were like deeply passionate, convicted about? Tell me about something that you were like deeply convinced was right the way. There's no other fucking way. It's just this way. But then your perspective changed. What happened? Hmm. You know, I think your lead in kind of inspires me to to think of a political opinion where I had to change my mind. Although there's a lot of a lot of times we have a we're convicted in a thing and realize that that thing might be wrong. That happened. I, I went through these crises of conscience when I first got to Morehouse, mm-hmm. where they do this thing where they tell you that they're going to take everything that you've ever believed and break it into pieces, oh. so that you can put them back together. And you might leave some pieces out and you might add some new pieces in. And there was a time where I thought that I was leaving Christianity out of those pieces. And my mama went into a full crisis and had an exorcism and had the pastor calling me. And <laughs> Lord, you going to hell. You know, it was my sacred quest. I had yeah. to leave Christianity, go and explore some other things. I came back around, you know. Okay. Yeah, I know. Love Christ, but the Christians are still a work in progress for me. Understood. But that Christ is on to something. Mm-hmm. You know, when I was at Morehouse, I graduated in 2009. My senior year was the height of the Democratic, probably the most intense Democratic primary between Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. And very early on, look, I'm I'm about to piss off some of you. You got to know your audience. I'm going to piss off some of your audience here. (laughs) Uh, Very, very early on, I was convinced that Hillary Clinton was the president for that crisis, for Mm -hmm. the economic crisis, the recession that we were in two unnecessary wars, and that she had just been battle-proven and tested, and Barack Obama is going to be a great president, just not this time. It did not take me long to change my mind. Mm. Uh, the first time I, I, I met and engaged and, and listened to Barack Obama, his inspiration, the hope that we can, in fact, be greater than our, our, our biggest sins and our biggest differences— that really inspired our generation. You know, I, I, call it, I call us the Obama generation because he was our introduction to a lot of politics and that's for better and for worse. I love this. You know, I'm going to make a confession to you because you made one to me in that very same election. You want to know who I voted for? Rosa Clemente and Cynthia McKinney because I was convinced. <laughs> I was convinced and shout out to my sister Rosa. You know, I would do it again, sis, because I love you. But actually, if I had the knowledge that I have now, if I had it then, I would have said, sis, I love you. And actually, I am going to vote to keep us from going off a cliff. I'm not actually going to cast a vote that makes me feel good, but doesn't move the needle the way I want it to for a whole bunch of reasons. And it took me a long time to like articulate what those reasons are. And I'm happy to Mm -hmm. share them for folks who might be listening, being like either A, what the fuck, or B, why are you hating on the Green Party? I am not fucking hating on the Green Party. I want to be clear with y'all. We've talked about this before, okay? There's what's in play and there's what's not in play. And I will get behind what is in play any day of the week. I will still help to make things that are not yet in play get into play. But That's in right. the meantime, honey, <laughs> we're trying to save lives here. And there's That's some right. very basic things we can do right then. So, Terrence, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for hearing my my deepest confessions about how I was like, 
I want a black woman and I want a Puerto Rican woman to run the country. I really do. You know what's so interesting, Alicia? Black voters, especially as we get older, uh, I think younger black voters have the opportunity to think more radically, to imagine the world as we want it. And we're still idealistic enough to believe that our generation is going to create that world. And I believe that we will. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. as we get older, Black voters vote so cautiously. And the reason I'm not ashamed to tell this uh, Hillary Clinton story, even today, where, you know, revisionist history, we'll have all mm-hmm. Black folks was with Obama. Everybody. It's, it's not true. <laughs> it's not true. It ain't true. true. In fact, the CBC endorsed Hillary Clinton, not Hello. a member of the CBC, the caucus. The whole thing. Right. The whole caucus. Right. And Barack Obama was a member of the CBC when they right. did it. <laughs> right. But the but but the, the example of black folks being cautious that I always give is South Carolina in the same election. Hillary Clinton was leading Barack Obama in South Carolina by 25 points until Iowa. Yep. He had been there every day, every week. Him and Michelle crisscrossing the state. They liked them, they loved them, but they said these white folks ain't never gonna do mm-hmm. that. So we're gonna be cautious. Listen. Until white folks prove something different in Iowa. So you know, we're yeah. cautious voters. We we vote to do no harm first before we vote for who we like the most. You play a really important role in our movement as a strategist, as a data scientist. And in fact, you founded a whole ass organization (laughs) to help us get it, get it better, and more importantly, get it right. So tell me a little bit about the the origin story of Hit Strategies. Why did you feel like an organization like this needed to exist? You know, I appreciate that, Alicia, and I appreciate uh, your your early vote of confidence in my my young company. We started Hit Strategies four years ago um, and, and have now grown to 41 employees. And we are a full service public opinion research firm. We do polling and focus groups for a lot of the progressive establishment, you know, a lot of Democratic candidates, even the Democratic Party. But what I'm most proud of is that we balance that work with the work of the movement. We consider ourselves a movement firm. And so we do research for, you know, NAACP and Black Lives Matter Global Network and Black Futures Lab. Color of Change and HRC, Emily's List, organizations that we believe are on the front lines of the communities that are often underrepresented or misrepresented in research. And when you get the research wrong, when you got the wrong people asking the questions, or when you're getting the answers from the wrong people, then you can really misalign the solutions, the interventions, the programs, the strategies that we're putting in place to help our communities. And that's true even of us. Mm -hmm. If we don't understand the communities that we are attempting to impact and help, then we could inject uh, interventions that are in fact misaligned. Mm -hmm. And so we started here four years ago for that explicit purpose, to uplift those voices that were being missed in research. For anyone that says, ain't nobody ever polled me, Ain't nobody ever called me. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, a part of what we realized that hit is that to gather and explore some of these opinions, it might not be picking up the phone and talking to folks for 15 minutes in a poll. Mm -hmm. We may have to text them one question at a time. We may have to remind them, hey, you answered six questions, but you still got three more and your opinion matters to us. I just got a text from Black Future Labs on Monday. Yes. About uh, about the need to to complete my black census. Listen, <laughs> so, and so you you know as as well as anyone that not only the need to collect these opinions, but the need to diversify how we're getting them. Sometimes you got to knock on doors. Sometimes you got to, you know, uh, get in high traffic places and just start snatching grabbing them. Yeah, but it's the only way to make sure these opinions are being lifted. And so that's what we've been doing, and we've had a chance to work with a bunch of kick ass dynamic candidates. Got a couple of them elected and got a couple of them we're still working on. And if mm. you're listening to this and you're running, Hit Strategies can help you get elected too. <laughs> <laughs> bet, bet. Tell me, like, of all the campaigns that you've worked on, because there's been a bunch. I know you, like, started four years ago, but you've been moving and grooving ever since. So 
Of all the campaigns that you've worked on thus far, is there one that sticks out to you as particularly compelling? You know, I, I often joke that I've worked every job on a campaign except the candidate. <laughs> <laughs> is that coming up for I you? Ever want. I will never want that job. I promise you. You oh, heard it okay. here. Okay. I don't, okay. Want, I don't want that. But, you know, that, that has given me an opportunity to be a canvasser and a communications person, a strategist, a poster. And in fact, early on, I, I, while I was at Morehouse, I was working for a, a little known state senator at the time named Kasim Reed. Oh, shit. <laughs> and he was running for mayor of Atlanta as my, my senior. And every single decision in the campaign, everything, even what we, I was a canvasser at the time, even what we were saying as we were knocking on doors, it all deferred back to the poll line. Mm. The fundraising strategy, communication strategy, canvas strategy, it all deferred back to the polling. And I, I finally started asking on, on from campaign to campaign, who are these pollsters making all these decisions? Because right. they not have been here. Right. They're not even in this campaign. It's like some wizard, you know, behind a curtain. So I started right. looking behind that curtain, Alicia, and realized there wasn't many people that looked like us behind those curtains. Right. There wasn't a lot of Black pollsters making decisions even for Black candidates, even in a city like Atlanta with a Black electorate, right. that the pollsters didn't always look like us. And that's what made me want to go into this work. To answer your question, the, my favorite campaigns, they may not be the most compelling campaigns, but they're the most fun I'm ever going to have on a okay. campaign. Okay, I'll I've worked with for, it. It's the last three mayors of Atlanta I've worked for. Since Kasim Reed, I've also worked for Keisha Lance Bottoms and now Andre Dickens. First of all, I know you live in Atlanta. I love that Atlanta had a mayor named Keisha. Mm -hmm. and replaced him with a man named Dre. Mm -hmm. I just love this city. Oh, you know. And it's such, that's your city. Now, you know, you got to claim that. <laughs> I'm going to claim it. I'm going to claim it because, you know, I claim all of us. And, it, you know, Atlanta just has such a, a young, vibrant culture, a very, very hip-hop culture, that the campaigns, the successful ones, the three that I worked on, all knew how, that they had to incorporate that, that culture. So we were doing buses from college campuses with Jeremiah in the back and young jock meeting folks at polling places. And <laughs> I mean, it was just fun. It's just I fun. love me some Jeremiah, let me just say. I love you, boo. Okay. <laughs> but here's the thing. So you said something very important that I really want to pick up on here, which is this piece about polling and data. And you are a hundred percent right that when you pull back the curtains. So much of what we hear about what Black people finna do, what Black people want, what Black people don't want, what Black people think, what who Black people are going to vote for, is not actually collected by Black people. That's right. Let me say That's that louder right. for the people who are listening. It's not actually collected by Black people. And in fact, when you turn on your television, whether you're watching CNN or MSNBC, they will often use like Quinnipiac polls. Right? That's right. And they will say, Black people think this. Black voters in this place think this. And then you look closer, which most people don't. They just start talking about what the poll said. You look closer and you go, huh, how many people did you talk to? And, you know, it might range from like, I don't know, 100 to 500. And you're like, wow. I mean, for some of us, that's our family reunion. That's right. <laughs> you, can't, that's you, right. Can't, you can't take you can't take all that. You can't take so all that. So tell me what do all the blacks think? Not you talk to them two hundred people. <laughs> correct, correct. And then and then in the poll, right? In the poll, because sometimes what they'll do is they'll say, This is what voters are gonna do. So then of course you gotta ask yourself, well, how many of those people are black? That's right. And my friend. Okay, so if you have a poll where they talk to five hundred people. Terrence, you do the math with me. When you see them <laughs> polls, on average, how many Black people have them polls talked to? Uh, they can report a number of what Black voters want in America based off of 30 or 40 responses. Now, ain't that some shit? That's I really some fucking shit. Feel, I really fucking <laughs> feel a way about that. But I have to tell y'all, this is... Um, Yes, it's racist, absolutely. But there's something else here that is actually important, which is that by and large, there really just isn't great data about Black people. What we think, right. what we want, what we do, what we don't do, what we need, there just really isn't. And it strikes me, Terrence, that one of the reasons I got so excited when I heard about Hit Strategies is I was like, oh shit, they want to talk about Black people and they're talking to Black people 
And a lot of them are black people. So this is fucking good for me. This is good for me because I'm trying to start this year Black Futures Lab. And I am not going to be moving my work by conjecture. I believe in being grounded in the people. So can you talk about this? Because I don't think people really get this. And it's important. It's important for when we hear President Biden say things like, or his camp or his administration, let me say, because President Biden, he was saying some shit back in the 90s, but he's been better. I'm going to give him some propers. He's been better to not be talking about what black people want this That's last right. four years. That's and I appreciate right. you. I appreciate you, Mr. President. Thank you. It seems like you're learning some lessons. But sometimes in his administration, people will talk about, well, black people want this. Mm-hmm. Black people want more money for police. Black people want more police. And then again, there's no other data. So you kind of just have to take the word. So talk to me a little bit about this. Explain to the people, Terrence, first and foremost, why is there no real great data on Black people? And why does that matter? You know, we were so excited when we met each other. You were you were literally <laughs> forging Black Futures Labs and I was forging hit and I was like, oh shit, a co-conspirator. Right, right, right. <laughs> oh man, we get to do this together. Okay. And, and since then, we have been doing this together. You know, we have been at each other's tables determining the right questions to ask, determining the right states we need to go into. I mean, we're trying to figure out how to do research in places where it's never Listen. been done. You asked me a few weeks ago, can we do focus groups in a certain place? I was like, I, I we'll don't know if it's ever been done, but we're going to figure it out, <laughs> you know, because exactly. and, I, and I've charged my entire company, even the not black ones. They all come with a cultural competency, yep. with the, with they understand that data has an ideology, you know, and, and they all understand their charge is to uplift the voices of the hardest to reach. If the other firms say that that research can't be done, we have to figure out how to do it. We got to figure out how to poll people that are incarcerated. I don't care if we can't call them. I don't care if we can't knock on that door. How do we get their opinions? Because they don't deserve to be ignored. Listen, if niggas can do TikTok videos from the cell, y'all can get up in there. <laughs> we can, they can answer 10 of my questions. <laughs> you hear me? And we have figured it out. We didn't send postcards. <laughs> and if you send the postcard back, you get a $10 credit to your, we, whatever to your it commissary. takes. Listen, That's right. it's possible. Okay, that's right. You. That's Continue. right. It's Continue. possible. And, and I, I want to just point out to your audience the bias that happens when this cultural competency, when this diversity is not included in the research. One way it happens is what we call interviewer bias. And that sounds real technical. But all it means is if someone Black answers the phone and someone white is asking the questions and I'm the Black person answering... Mm-hmm. then I'm going to answer in a way that white people need to hear me answer. That part. That part. Right? And the prime example is, you know, please tell me your approval of Barack Obama. Mm-hmm. Well, it depends. What they what are telling think. white researchers, <laughs> that's right. I can tell you right now, what black folks are telling white researchers is a little bit different than what they tell me when I get them in a focus room. It ain't because they don't love them to death. Mm-hmm. But they also get, in hindsight, they get to start pointing to some things that they wish would have gone different. We're not going to talk about family business outside the family. So, so some of these white researchers are just not going to get that. Mm-hmm. Another example of this is, and this is a very popular poll question, what issue is most important to you today? Right? And they list all kinds of education and crime and guns and climate change and the economy. And yep. Well, what we have found, Alicia, is that the number one, two, or three issue for Black folks every single time we've asked that question is an issue that other pollsters don't even include, racism and discrimination. Period. It is a top three issue of every time we have ever asked it, and they don't even include it. How are you measuring what is important to Black folks? And the thing that is most important ain't even in the measurement. Mm You know, these are the gaps that we're trying to solve for here. And I'll give you a more practical and more recent example, because we started this talking about COVID, because this is how these biases can literally be life or death. Mm -hmm. My company did a lot of research around vaccine hesitancy, because when that vaccine first rolled out, a lot of Black folks wasn't having it. Mm -hmm. And there was this acceptance from the market that Black people are just rejecting it because they don't trust it. You know, that, there, that there's a cynicism or a distrust. 
And yes, that is also true. There's a lot of valid distrust of medical systems in the Black community. And we, we heard For a lot of, we heard a lot of Tuskegee experiments in these, in these focus groups. Yep. And forced fertilization, et cetera. But what we found was that of the, the community of Black folks that hadn't been vaccinated, that in fact, half of them had structural, but they didn't know where, they didn't know how much it how? costs. Correct. They didn't, it wasn't all attitudinal. It wasn't all that they rejected it, that half of the Black folks just didn't know how, when, where. And those were structural barriers that we were able to discover through the research and then start messaging and start pulling trucks up in those communities and getting jabs in arms and quite literally saving lives. Mm -hmm. I believe that research has that power. And we're trying to make sure that we are harnessing that power for our community. so glad that you said this and I'm so happy that HIT exists and I can tell y'all we have worked with HIT on tons of projects and every single time what I'm so grateful for is that we can really nuance what it is that our people care about not just for the sake of like everything that black people say is important okay that is not what we're doing and here. is no it is. However, that's not why we're doing this. The reason that we're doing this is because if you don't have good information, you can't develop good strategy. And you know who don't be having good information a lot of the time? The people we need to have a better strategy. That's right. Like, for real, for real. So um, right. the other reason I'm really glad you said this is because sometimes we forget that polls can be just racist. And data can be racist. Data has data been used be racist. in racist ways since we started collecting data. Does anybody remember the bell curve? I mean, like, can we just talk about the fact that data has been used to target Black people? And I, I want to be clear that during the COVID-19 pandemic, especially early on, there was this like narrative about Black people getting covid disproportionately and being impacted differently by COVID because um, we didn't take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I fucking felt a way about that because that's not fucking true. And as I was mm -hmm. reading these op-eds that Black people were writing, and I'm not going to get in on the man today because I'm working on it. Okay, God but is I'll working on me. I'll come back tomorrow me. if you want to. No. I am, God is working <laughs> on me. But when Van Jones wrote that motherfucking op-ed, Okay, well, I guess God ain't working on me today. When Van Jones wrote that op-ed about how Black people need to be healthier, I swear to God, I was sitting outside in my backyard reading this op-ed as my neighbor, Ivy, was in the back doing jumping jacks, okay? I was like, wait a minute. I'm over here in the hood. My neighbor over here doing jumping jacks. Black woman, 65 years old, over here doing jumping jacks because she's been in the damn house all day. She's not right. unhealthy. She's not unhealthy. It's just like, Where's the fucking grocery store in the neighborhood? She's doing what That's she right. can with what she got. So I'm just really appreciating this. Sometimes we can take up these narratives too, and it's fucked up. Let me move the topic because I ain't going to ask you to talk about Van Jones because we don't have to well, do actually, that today. Can I give you one more? I just want to give one more <laughs> because, you know, this is a part of how data could be racist and how research can be racist. It's when the outcome of research is to determine Black people's problems. What problem do Black people have why they won't get the vaccine? What problem do Black people have why they are uh, have different health outcomes? Mm -hmm. As opposed to, and this is where, again, we have reoriented our entire company. The charge of the company is, what are the barriers preventing Black people from solving these problems? Mm -hmm. What are the barriers preventing Black people from better health outcomes? Because if we'd have went in looking for the problem with vaccine hesitancy, we'd have found Tuskegee, we'd have found trust. Right. We, but when you start looking for barriers to move, you find access and cost and information, you know, information and things that we can actually fix. Mm -hmm. And you're you're so right, Alicia. Research and data has ideology, and it can be racist. Child, child. 
Okay, let me let me pivot because now I want to go on a whole rant about why I think that op-ed got written, but I'm just going to let that be because God is actually working on me and I felt that. So let me just let me just keep it moving because I want to ask about 2024. I told you this is all that I think about. I wake up in the morning, I'm like, "Hmm. How am I feeling about our chances in 2024 and is there anything else I can be doing today?" to help us have better chances. This is literally me. This is what I'd be thinking about. Okay, that and my nails and what next pattern I'm going to do. (laughs) Um, But I want to ask you, Terrence, because there's a lot at stake for Black communities in 2024. And this upcoming election, I think, has raised the stakes in very particular ways. So I want to ask your opinion. What do you think is at stake for Black communities in the 2024 election? And where do you think our focus needs to be and why? Yeah, Alicia, you know, I think that we, Black folks, Black voters, but also Black organizers and leaders, I think we have to do a better job of taking credit Mm. for the progress that has been made. Mm. I think far too often we allow this narrative of ain't nothing changing and ain't nothing happening and ain't, and Biden ain't do this and Biden, but we really do have to point to and name the progress that's being made. And it was because of a project that we did with Black Futures Labs. We were able to, when he first got elected, this was in March of 2021. He hadn't been in office for 90 days yet. Mm -hmm. And we were able to ask Black folks, not just what issue is most important to you, but what do you want to see done about climate change? What do you want to see done about police reform or economy, et cetera? And gave them 10 options. And we got the rank order. and, And since then, since March of 2021, we've been able to measure the progress on this agenda. And the truth is, 80% of the things that Black folks said that they wanted to see this administration do have either been completed or at least been initiated. Mm -hmm. That includes banning no-knock warrants, banning chokeholds, National Registry of Police Misconduct, mandatory body cameras, and ending the federal government's relationship with federal prisons. That's just on the police reform agenda. Mm-hmm. Do you know, we could do the same thing on climate change. Mm-hmm. I mean, and I want to be clear, this is where we have to change the narrative. I don't think that that is a testament to a great white hope in Washington. Mm-hmm. I think that is a testament to what voters accomplished. A multiracial coalition accomplished when they stood together and demanded more from this government. And it has been happening. Hearing aids over the counter, insulin at $35. These are things that save people's lives. This ain't insignificant. Mm -hmm. Child tax credit that reduced Black poverty by 40%. 40% of young, poor Black kids wasn't poor. Mm -hmm. That Mm -hmm. is because we voted. And I think we need more of us to tell us how our votes are making our lives better. The last thing I want to say here is we have to understand what choice we're making because I think far too often, and we started this about how Black folks could be cautious voters, far too often we want to vote for the person that we like the most or the person that we agree with the most. And frankly, some of the stakes are far too high here. And I do think there's a difference between an existential threat in one party Mm -hmm and an imperfect ally Mm -hmm. in another party. Democrats are not perfect. They are not moving on all of the things that we need them to. But when Joe Biden became president, the organization that you founded, Black Lives Matter, was a terrorist organization. That's right. Today, the Proud Boys have been convicted of sedition. The Oath Keepers are on that terrorist list and the Black Lives Matter are not on that. That's because we voted, y'all. We got to stop saying shit ain't nothing happening. That is bullshit. It's happening. It ain't fast enough and it ain't enough, but it's happening. And we should take credit for that as we go and encourage people to go out here and vote again. Just like that, it's time for our weekly roundup of all the things Lady Just Ain't Gonna Do This Week. Number one, California Senator Dianne Feinstein, dead at 90. 
basketball team, California Senator Dianne Feinstein, passed away this week at age 90. Feinstein was the first woman to become mayor of San Francisco and was technically the first woman to represent California in the United States Senate. I mean, it's a funny story. Even though Barbara Boxer won her seat in the same election, Feinstein was sworn in just like a few minutes before Boxer. And while Feinstein won her seat as San Francisco mayor after Harvey Milk was murdered, we need to be careful to interrogate narratives that soften the blow of the legacy that she left. For more on that legacy, you can check out this excellent article in 48 Hills. We love a first, as you know, and we celebrate a first. But what does it mean to be a first if you use it to do the same old, same old? Here's the other thing. Her death has lady thinking about what we do with power. Now, there's a lot in the news about Congress and especially what's going on in the Senate that we're going to get to in a minute. But she really did hold on to that seat despite being the richest woman in Congress until her last breath. Now, we didn't get a successor in the sense that she like trained somebody else or even a few somebodies to, I don't know, get a shot at helping to lead the country, which is kind of wild to me. Toward the end, she was not her best self. And that's not speaking ill of the dead, y'all. That's just telling the fucking truth. But she's not the only one. What do we make of that practice of staying until the bitter end and then actually not passing the baton like so many people preach about. And staying there allowed her to keep other women from advancing. I mean, just ask Barbara Lee. We're going to come right back onto that, though, because I got more to say about that. Okay. Other things Lady ain't going to do this week is pit Black people against immigrants like immigrants ain't Black people, too. Hello, somebody? Now, this has really been sitting on my heart the last couple of weeks because... I've been seeing anti-immigrant hysteria being whipped up, not just from white people, but from black people talking like white people, as if white people don't be talking about us the same way that you be talking about them. Okay, let's give some context here before I go the fuck off. Folk are wilding right now, talking about the migrant crisis, where thousands of migrants are showing up in cities across the country, overwhelming local infrastructure. Cities like New York, Chicago, Phoenix, Philly, you name it. And then you have these political stunts where the really racist racists like Governor Ron DeSantis, who ain't gonna make it as president child, or Governor Greg Abbott, those kind of racists, are literally kidnapping people, literally putting people on planes and buses under false pretenses and shipping them off to places like Martha's Vineyard and Washington, D.C. to so-called liberal cities to highlight, well, I'm not sure exactly what they're trying to highlight, except that they're assholes. So we have an actual crisis, and then we have a manufactured crisis, and they're colliding. Well, it didn't help that New York Mayor Eric Adams missed an opportunity to actually have a political career by playing right into that, saying that it was going to destroy New York City, which was not only just untrue, but it was also dumb and spoken like someone who don't know that literally, New York literally, epitomizes a place where people can migrate to and make it. You know, that thing that's inscribed under the Statue of Liberty, which is where? New York. That says, you know, give me your tired, your hungry, your huddled masses, yearning to be free. Idiot. Okay, so let's keep going. We clearly have a public education crisis in this country. So there's layers and layers to this, y'all. And truly, if it could just be solved by sending people back to where they came from, it would have been solved already. No, seriously, you ever think about that? But here's the truth, and it's the honest-to-God truth. There would be no economy without immigration. And that's the reason ain't nobody locking up all immigrants or whatever, because as much complaining as these weirdos do, they never actually acknowledge that there is no way to have an economy in America, without immigration, legal or illegal. So stop the bullshit already. Our economy here in the United States plays a role in not just attracting immigration, but driving it. But you don't want to get up off YouTube long enough to actually get some clarity about why this is happening. Okay. But even worse, some of y'all are out here um, talking the same shit and yo asses is immigrants too. All the black folk that be like, I'm Jamaican or whatever. So what do you think that actually means, bro? So just Jamaican immigration, but not other immigration? I mean, what are we, no, what are you talking about? 
my people. I give more room for us than some of these other clowns because I get it. We all struggling and everybody want to know why they got shit and I ain't got shit. I get it. But here's what's real. I need you to focus. You're not about to black business your way out of immigration. You're not about to black dollar your way out of this. And let me tell you why. It's all a shared pot. The way you would need to not just consume, but produce and distribute, because that's literally what an economy is. Let me just ask you, actually, before I get into this, let me just ask you, how do you plan to produce, distribute and consume without relying on nobody else that ain't black by your shallow ass standards? Let me see the proposal. And remember, you got to provide for at least 40.1 million people. And that's just non-Latino black people. Which leads me to my other point. How are you going to be pro-black and anti-immigrant when there are black immigrants? Like, seriously, what are we even fucking talking about? I'm pressed about this shit, my G. Like, we have black people everywhere, like all over the world, like all throughout Latin America, all throughout the Caribbean. Shall I keep going? Because literally black people are everywhere. I mean, are you anti-Haitian immigrants? Are you anti-African immigrants? Because, you know, I'm just asking for a friend because those are also the folks that are in these shelters and shit. So this is just some weird shit. And I get it that what you're actually saying is why are we suffering? Well, let me ask you this. Let's start with affordable housing just for shits and giggles. Let's say you want to know why there isn't enough affordable housing for black people. You might catch yourself watching the news and saying, well, how come immigrants are getting housing and we not? Well, that's a silly question because it's not true. Immigrants aren't getting more affordable housing than black people are. You just you can't actually find that anywhere. It's not true. Now, the people in power that keep that affordable housing availability real low and them dollars flowing to affordable housing real small. Well, they do that because affordable housing don't make their developer friends any money. So fight developers, not immigrants. And consider that you might actually get more people behind you from every place where people need affordable housing instead of doing that age-old crabs-in-a-bucket bullshit. Now, a mentor of mine used to say to me, everybody talks about crabs in a bucket, but nobody talks about the fact that the bucket is not the crab's natural habitat. I need y'all to sit with that for a minute. The bucket is not the crab's natural habitat. Look at what this country does to us. It's ugly shit. What's wrong with this country isn't immigrants, it's greed. It's greed. And that's free game for you. So lesson of the day, don't get caught up in white people's games. That's for them and that's between them. And hating on immigrants is white people's business, not ours. We deserve a different game. And really and truly, like really and truly, we ain't got to fight each other for crumbs when we can have the whole fucking pie. Marinate on that for a minute. Man, y'all sound real wild out here talking like Ron DeSantis, but you black. That shit is wild, though. Whew. Anyway. Other things Lady Ain't Gonna Do this week, Governor Gavin Newsom was a savage this week and not in the best of ways. So I needed to take my time with this one because I got to say I get it and all. But y'all had some real interesting takes on the news hits this week with respect to Governor Gavin Newsom. So let's start with the news first, which is that Governor Gavin Newsom was a savage this week. And usually I say this in the best of ways, like Beyonce and Meg the Stallion type of savage. But This time, I'm also using it the other way, which is to say like a ruthless, heartless way too. And yes, we already know that the white people done called us savages back in the day and actually probably yesterday and maybe even five minutes ago. But again, we're not playing white people's games on today. So please take me at my word about what I mean or don't take me at all. You dig? Okay. So two things happened in the great state of California this week. Number one, Governor Newsom vetoed a bill that would have given domestic workers in the state OSHA protections, you know, safety and health protections, which right now they are exempted from. Yeah, he vetoed a similar piece of legislation in 2020 as he argued that private homes cannot be treated in the exact same manner as a traditional workplace or a work site from a regulatory standpoint. Mm. All right, so what do you mean by that? For many women, bro, especially women of color and black women, homes are our workplaces. 
Yeah. I mean, we are the majority of people who clean homes, who take care of y'all babies, who provide in-home care services, you know, all the things that it takes for this country to function. So that was a whack-ass savage move to deny black and brown women not once but twice protections on the job. But it was a nice move for their wealthy employers. Yeah. Speaking of catering to the wealthy, we don't get into this conversation about what in the fuck happened with the California Senate seat that was recently vacated due to the death of Senator Dianne Feinstein. Now, I have a lot of thoughts on this, but I'm only going to share some of them. Governor Newsom, who has done some good stuff that I agree with. So don't be out here talking about you bashing Governor Newsom. No, I'm just telling the fucking truth. He did some whack shit this week to keep a specific black woman out of the United States Senate. Now, look, I love me some LaFonza, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, okay? She is a solid choice, and she has a very promising career in politics, should she choose it. You ain't finna get no, and I mean no, hateration from me with respect to LaFonza, so let me be loud and clear about that. And not in the, like, I'm going to be gracious in the streets, but a hater behind doors, because some of y'all on that whack-ass shit, too, and it stinks. But let's put that aside for a minute because she's going to get her own section where I'm about to love up on her ass. So let's go back to the governor. Governor Newsom essentially tried to knock Barbara Lee out the Senate race. That's a fact. First, he refused to ask Senator Feinstein to step down from her seat, even though she very, very, very clearly could not and was not performing the duties of her office. That's a fact. He let her languish in that seat allowed her staff to act as her proxy for a long-ass time, so much time, in fact, that there was story after story after story written about her incompetencies in her role. He then, after she finally announced that she wouldn't run again, but she also wasn't going to retire, opined that he would only appoint a caretaker for the role, not anybody who was running for the office. He didn't have the nerve to do that back in 2020 when Senator Kamala Harris became vice president. And then he appointed Alex Padilla over what would have been the obvious choice, which was Barbara Lee. That was some weird shit then. But this decision in this year at this time in politics is even fucking weirder. Sir, why wouldn't you want your appointment to be able to win again? That don't even make no sense. Do you not see we are in a fight for our lives, sir? But then, then, as he was appointing LaFonza to the seat, once again, skipping over the congresswoman from his state with seniority, he said that he was not going to prevent them from running in the upcoming election, of which the primary is just a few short months away, which can only mean one thing. Governor Newsom got a personal beef with Congresswoman Lee. Perhaps it's because she clocked correctly that his commitment to fill the seat with a black woman didn't mean a caretaker black woman. It meant actually appointing someone you want to stay there because you value having a black woman in that seat. But I get it, Governor. I mean, it was 2020 and being anti-racist was in vogue then. I'm placing this at the governor's feet because that's where it belongs. And this ain't me talking shit for real. It's just keeping it a buck. Here's what I really want to say here, and I'm really keeping it 100. I also get that there are valid reasons why he might not have wanted to appoint her from a political standpoint. Now, I love me some Congresswoman Lee, for real, and all y'all know this. I really just wish that the governor had been clear about his position about this Black woman and not created what could have been a real mess. Hell, he could have asked the congresswoman to serve and then make way for new leadership after a full term. It's a tricky situation. Here we are talking about a Congress that's aging and what that means for the country. And so I get it. Trust me. But if that was part of the governor's consideration, why didn't he apply it to the white woman who literally died of old age in her seat? I'm unclear. This is why it's not far-fetched to talk about this move as not smelling good. What the governor should have said was, I'm in my feelings because she called me a racist and I don't like that. So tough shit. Deal with it. That's politics. That's what he should have said. But instead, he pulled a jack move and basically tried to take her out over hurt feelings. And I guess that's politics or whatever, but it stank. I'm also going to say this. Some of y'all tried to put it on LaFonza and side talk shit about corporate ties and her saying yes when others said no. Look, y'all. I don't know. 
I'm not on that tip. I think people have the right to be ambitious. This sits at the feet of the governor and the governor only. After all, he's the one positioning to run for president in a few years. I mean, we're all basically moves on that chessboard if we're just going to keep it 100. And that is also politics. So I'm thinking we might should have the congresswoman on to talk about her viewpoint on this, but I just gave you mine. Well, most of it. (laughs) Stay tuned. Well, here's what we want more of this week. California Governor Gavin Newsom appoints LaFonza Butler to the United States Senate. Now, speaking of politics, I actually big smiled when I got the news that LaFonza Butler was selected to serve. Now, I had the pleasure and opportunity to interview LaFonza on stage at Lesbians Who Tech last year in Frisco. And that episode is a part of our podcast, so you can go back and listen to it. And of course, she is legendary in the world of organized labor. LaFonza is the first Black lesbian to serve in the United States Congress and is now the only Black woman and the only Black lesbian in the United States Senate. And yeah, if it couldn't be our sister Barbara, LaFonza is an excellent choice. And if she decides to run, she could win. She can raise money, she can move people, and she is wicked smart and actually would give these senators a run for their money, honey. I'm with the shit. It actually takes a lot to say yes as a Black lesbian to serve in the United States Senate at this point in history, at this time, with these weirdos. And baby, it's not the money. Trust me, you can make more money for less stress elsewhere. You better believe that. So congratulations, dear sister. We are counting on you to do us proud. Other things Lady Loves this week, my friends, is that Kevin McCarthy fucked around and found out. Now, honey... If we go end this roundup this week on this note, you know, I just have to say this. Kevin McCarthy said, I wish a motherfucker would, and then a motherfucker did. 216 motherfuckers to be exact. Now, I was watching this dude this week on the television, and he was talking big shit with his chest out like the white Suge Knight. But no, friends, he is no Suge Knight. That Count Dracula motherfucker, Matt Gates took his ass out. Now, my mom used to say, don't write checks your ass can't cash. And I realized on this week exactly what she meant. This man made a deal with some devils and then thought to himself that he was smarter than the devils. But oh, no, sir, this was never, ever going to work out in your favor. And let me tell you why. The one thing I could say you might have had going for you is that you talked the shit, but you wasn't about that shit. But these people are actually about that shit. And they showed you exactly that by booting your ass out because they could. In other words, fuck around, you gonna find out. (laughs) Lord. Tell the people who are listening right now who want to know more about you, want to know more about your work, how they can follow you on the socials. Absolutely. So my company is Hit Strategies. You can follow us on Twitter at Hit Strat. You can follow us on Instagram at Hit Strat, S-T-R-A-T, Hit Strat. And you can follow me on Instagram at T underscore Woodbury. We put a lot of data into the world. We put a lot of insights into the world. And frankly, folks, it's oftentimes what's missing from the world. So please check us out. Yes. Thank you, Terrence. We loved having you. Thank you for being here. I can't wait to come back. I'll see you soon. It's on. Oh, yeah, it's on. That's it for Lady Don't Take No, but I will be back here with a brand new conversation and some more news that you can always use. We appreciate you joining us. And please, let's keep the conversation going. Tell us what's on your mind. Tell us what you like and tell us what you ain't going to take no more of. We post ways to do something about things you hear on this show all over our socials. So if we got you amped up today, please check out the socials to find out how you can take action. On Twitter, we're at Lady Take. On Insta, we're at Lady Don't Take No Pod. We're also on Facebook at Lady Don't Take No Podcast by Alicia Garza. And, and seriously, we really, really deeply appreciate it when you subscribe and write us a review. So let the people know what you've heard here today. Our producer is Phil Circus. Our incredible theme is Violet 
This pod is supported by the Black Futures Lab. And me, I'm your host, Alicia Garza. Remember, take any of that smoke you trying to give to LaFonza Butler and hand that shit right back over to Governor Newsom where it belongs. When it comes to the migrant crisis, Black people ain't got no business doing the crabs in a barrel thing. That anti-immigrant shit is white people's business, not ours, so don't get caught slipping. Okay, for real. This week's message, my friends, is all about understanding who your friends are and who is just being your friend because they want some shit from you. And that is on Mary Had a Little Lamb. That's right. I said it. <laughs> because lady don't take no. Lady don't take no shit. Insist don't respect the sister. Walk around like a woman. If she won't speak less of something worse. Saying don't play. The girl take herself so serious. People stare curious. She got a natural way. Her hips way furious. Never luxurious. Love y'all. Like-